it has been like eight months since I've been able to work on this table. I don't know about you, but 2020 was a hellacious year for a lot of people, for a lot of reasons, uh, myself included. Fortunately, I dodged the uh, nasty bug that was going around, but had another medical problem that put me out of commission for quite a while. But I'm grateful to be better and back to work and have plenty of stuff coming. So if you're here and you're watching this, you survived 2020, way to go you. And to my adoring audience out there of one, hi mom, uh, thanks for sticking around and we'll hopefully get some new content rolling out here soon. On occasion, my local lumber yard has curly maple in their stacks of regular maple lumber. They don't cull it, they don't pull it out, but you gotta go digging through the pile to find it. And for this table project, I've been storing it up for months, months and months and months and months. And I found some real pretty stuff. It was four quarter thick, nice tight curly figure down the entire length, really beautiful material. So I'll be using this to make this dining room tabletop. Although I was excited to get this tabletop project underway, I have to admit it broke my heart to cut up these big beautiful slabs of maple into the pieces that I was going to need for the tabletop sections. But, you know, you just swallow hard and say, okay, I got to do this. <laughs> no guts, no glory, and plow forward. to six weeks later. Uh, yeah, it, it was it was a lot of pieces. There's like eight pieces of walnut per table half times two plus the three leaves and carry the foot. 
I don't, I don't know. It was a lot of cutting, a lot of little individual pieces, but just look at these. They're gorgeous. This is gonna be so sweet. I definitely learned from my first attempt at gluing this up. I cannot even begin to tell you what a categoric mess it was. There were things skewed and twisted and cupped and it was a nightmarish mess. I deleted all of the video of me doing that monstrosity and made sure it was deleted off the backup drives and everything so it could never ever ever be traced back to me. But for this new glue up, I was going to play it safe. I did this one piece at a time, gluing in one section, waiting for the glue to set up, making sure it was aligned properly, and I did that one bit at a time until both sides of the tabletop and all three leaves were fully assembled. As you can imagine, that took a few days, or a few weeks, or a few months. I can't remember. It's all a blur of pain and glued fingers. But yeah, it came together. It really came together. I spent a good bit of time with both a random orbit sander and a belt sander focusing on trying to get the top surface of the table as flat and uniform as possible. I went over it and over it and over it with a straight edge, checking for gap, making sure that I got it as flat as it could possibly be. I don't have a planer large enough to run something like this through, so all of the surfacing and flattening had to be done by hand. In a separate effort, I had built this torsion box table surface thing. The idea being that it would be a very flat surface that I could reference off of. I needed to be able to resurface the back side of this tabletop. The glue up had left the back less pristine than the front and I need to thickness that wood evenly so that both sides of the tabletop would be uniform. To that end, I milled down two 2x4s to be exactly the same thickness as each other and clamped them to either side of this torsion box table. In doing so, it will allow me to run a sled back and forth across those two 2x4s and inside of this sled I can put a router with a bottom cutting bit that will allow me to uniformly plane the back side of this tabletop to the same thickness as the other two assemblies. To flatten the tabletop I'm going to use a bottom cutting bit in my router. The bottom cutting bits are nice because they're fairly wide they're not like a straight bit, which are long, but pretty narrow. These cut a fairly wide path, and they cut it absolutely flat. Well, as flat as your router is capable of traveling. And by dropping the router into the sled and moving it back and forth, I'll end up with a nice flat back to this tabletop.
This tabletop will feature breadboard ends, but in order to attach those breadboard ends to the tabletop, I have to plow out some dados on the ends of the table and on the breadboard end pieces themselves. Using a straight cutting bit on my router, I plowed these out to an inch and three-eighths deep on both the ends and the tabletop. Okay, after some admittedly nerve-wracking routing, because, you know, you screw that up and you screwed up the top that you've spent so much time putting together, I managed to get all of the dados cut in the top and in the breadboard ends. And these breadboard ends are going to sit and connect to the top via a set of floating tenons. Uh, what I did for each breadboard end was take a plane and cut a bit of material out of the middle, make a couple passes, do the same, move out a little bit, take a couple more passes. And what that's going to do is slightly dish out the center of the breadboard ends, creating a concave surface. And when the breadboard end is pressed up against the tabletop, the ends of the breadboard end will be tight to the edges, but I will have a small gap in the middle. Let me move you a little closer here so I can possibly show that a little better. So with the breadboard end pushed tightly to the table, the ends are tight, but the center has a small gap. It's not much, maybe a sixteenth of an inch or so. What is that, two millimeters? And when we clamp the table and the breadboard end together with a glued uh, tenon in the center, the breadboard end will be pulled tight to the middle, which will cause the edges to spring tightly against the outside edges. Um, this table is solid wood, so we can't glue a tenon in all the way across. It would cause the tabletop to crack. We don't want that. But we do want this breadboard end to be nice and tight along its length. And using a sprung breadboard will give us that tight jo fitting joint. For the tenons, I milled up some scrap maple into thickness that was exactly three-eighths of an inch. The router bit that I used to cut these dados was also three-eighths of an inch. But I planed this down so that I got a very, very tight fit in this joint. Uh, tight enough that I'm going to have to use some light hammer taps to get it in. And I want this to be tight in the gap. If it had slop and could move up and down, it could cause the breadboard end to pivot or tilt when you put a little bit of weight on it, like somebody sitting at the table with their arms on the breadboard end. So by cutting in an inch and three-eighths in on either end, and by cutting this slot tight with the tenon, I should end up with a breadboard end that not only fits tightly across its length, but also doesn't have a tendency to rock in the gap.
perfect example of why you should always cut your parts larger than they need to be. When I was fitting the breadboard ends, I managed to fat finger one of them, drop it on the floor, which mushroomed the corner. If this had happened and my piece was exactly the length I needed, there would have been a gap in the breadboard end and that would have looked terrible. So as it turned out, this piece will be cut off so it won't matter, but this is why you cut your pieces long. In order to cover a rather unsightly adjustment I had to make to the breadboard end pieces, I decided that I would wrap the entire tabletop surface in an additional strip of walnut. I had these two planks of walnut that were, well, you can, you can see here, it's kind of swirly, crazy grain pattern. I don't know what this would be called in terms of figure, maybe marbled walnut, something like that. But they're really pretty, um, but they're both, they're both bowed along the length pretty badly and they're not in great shape. So they would work just fine as strips that I could glue to the edge of the tabletop. And I'm, that'll give me a couple of advantages. First of all, it's gonna cover a mistake I'm gonna show you here in a second, but it's also gonna give me a thicker looking top. After the tops were planed down, they were only about 7 eighths of an inch thick, which is pretty thick, but I wanted kind of a heavier looking table surface. And a couple of the breadboard ends had a pretty severe cup in them. Um, uh, severe enough that I was concerned that if I put the end on, it would cause the tabletop to spring upward. So I had to put some relief cuts into the breadboard to pull it down flat and allow it to sit correctly on the tenons without possibly bowing the tabletop. And of course, you know, that leaves these ugly kerf marks in the side of the breadboard, which will conveniently be covered up by this maple edge banding that I'm going to put on. So that's next. I'm going to take these two planks of walnut that I can't really use for anything else because they're, they're twisted and warped, cut them into strips and glue them over the edge of the tabletop. And that again will hide these curves and give me a much thicker looking top. All right, that gives me two inch high strips of walnut. I've put a miter on one end that will sit into this corner. I'm going to miter these corners against one another and then I will glue this along the length of the breadboard end. And this won't cause problems with splitting or cracking because I've got long grain to long grain here. And that'll effectively clean up this edge where I had to cut some curves and, you know, maybe even stiffen the top a little bit, make it less likely to warp over time. But uh, that's what's next. I'm going to glue these in, and then we'll uh, pick back up on the next step. I've gotten all of the walnut edge banding applied and as you can see here I split the banding where it comes across this breadboard edge you know this this table is going to tend to expand or contract in this direction this breadboard edge is floating on the end of the panel so it was necessary to create a break here in the edge banding that will still allow this panel to move and not bind up the corners I just mitered, but this is not a very strong joint. It's, it's a glued miter, and I guess you know it would hold together some, but I don't want to take the chance that these miters are going to separate and split. So I'm going to 
reinforce these on the back side with some strips of plywood. Um, but as you can see, all of the edge banding is on all the leaves, all the main tabletop sections peeking out under there. Now for, for support, I have some of this pretty, pretty ugly plywood. This is, uh, these are off cuts from some kind of packing carton, packing crates. On some of these, there's a bunch of like Chinese or Asian writing on them. But anyway, what's, what's good about it, it's, it's very low quality plywood. There's lots of voids and it's, you know, not real good stuff, but it is almost an inch thick. It's 15, a little over 15 sixteenths of an inch thick. So pr I'm guessing it's probably 25 millimeter. And I'm going to cut strips of this about three inches wide, which will sit underneath the lip of this back banding here. I'll glue it to the back banding and glue it to the underside of the table. That'll provide support to keep this edge banding from you know, rocking or possibly being broken off. And in the corner, it'll reinforce this miter. and increase the likelihood that it'll stay together. So that's next. I'm going to cut a bunch of uh, three inch wide strips and get to work on gluing them to the underside of this tabletop and on all of the leaves. There'll be a similar strip here underneath to back up the edge banding on all the leaves.